Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode five of the Underground Kings podcast. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Mr. Tom Winslow. I don't know about how special that is. <laughs> Founding attorney of Winslow Law in Polly's Island, South Carolina. Yes, sir. That's me. Mr. Winslow, how are That's you today? My wife says. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, um, kick things off here. Uh, why don't you tell us all a little bit about Winslow Law? Sure. Yeah, so Winslow Law is a law firm designed a little bit uniquely, Holden. Uh, Every person knows an attorney. Every person knows a law firm. But law firms are designed one of two ways, generally. One is you have an attorney who tries to do everything, right? And, and you know, when you try to do everything, you don't know anything very well, right? Or you get a law firm that does one thing, and only one thing, and they know it well, but they can't help a person or a community as a whole, right? So the concept of the law firm of Winslow Law is to put together those pieces that benefit the community. That's why we say committed counsel our clients, community, and coworkers, right? So what we have is we have a number of attorneys in the firm that know a field of law very well, but combined, they know most of the law to help their community and clients as best as possible, right? So we have someone that does family, someone else that does criminal, someone else that does estate planning and probate, civil litigation, and on and on. So when a business or person comes, they can receive full benefit. They don't have to go to 14 different law firms. They come to one place. Okay. And, uh, how many individuals are currently employed by Winslow Law? We have 16 in-house, right? We have an office in Polly's and in Columbia. Um, number of attorneys, six attorneys, number of staff. And, and it's our job to work with these people in the office. But we have people outside the office, right, that we work with a number of people. We have a branding team and we have our financial team. So total about 25 total on a daily basis works with the firm. Sounds like a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of moving parts, especially from where we started, right? So it's amazing where uh, God has brought us at this point. Let's, uh, let's delve into that. Let's delve into so a lot of what we like to do on this podcast is, you know, we kind of highlight where you're at Go for um, it. from a business perspective as well as personal life. Sure. Uh, and then we like to get into the nitty gritty. We sure. like to delve into your past and see, you know, what brought you to this point, bumps Big along end. the way, because I'm sure there's a fair share. It's been perfect. Nothing bad. <laughs> right. Ever. <laughs> um, so, so let's, let's rewind all the way back to um, your younger years. Okay. Um, you know, did you plan on, when did you kind of decide to become an attorney to go the, the legal route and kind of just tell us the story, tell her the story up to this point? Sure. So um, going all the way back to the day, I started working, I was 14 years old. I was a janitor in the middle school where I went to classes. So imagine eighth grade, right? And you see people throwing, you know, gum at each other and throwing paper balls at each other and then realizing you're the one that has to clean that up, right? <laughs> or a massive food fight in the cafeteria, and you're the one that has to mop the floor, right? And so that was me. So all the way back to 14, I would, um, I played soccer. Uh, I was in, you know, in all these academic societies, classes, and I, at 14, decided to get a job because that's when you could get a job. And so I was working, uh, going to school all day, going to my activities, doing soccer practices, working after school and volunteering, clean all this stuff up, and it really ingrained in me this kind of this work ethic, I guess you can call it, and that's where my dad was. My dad would work six months at a time and be gone, and I wanted to see him because he was working for those full six months. And so I had this put inside of me to work like this, and, and I kept going, kept going. Um, my next-door neighbor was an attorney, and I would go on weekends and at nights to his law firm just as an intern at 14, 15, after working and after school and just being there in that atmosphere to learn what being in a law firm was, to learn what being a lawyer was, because I had that interest. And, and I continued to grow that interest uh, all the way through high school, especially when friends and I would get into legal trouble. Uh, I had a couple of friends that went to juvie, uh, and I probably would have gone if not for my neighbor and if not for my willingness <laughs> and my ability to work, because of some of the stuff we did was bad stuff. And that's, you know, a lot of times where you come from is you learn from your mistakes, you learn from your experiences, and those that don't have those same kind of, honestly, I call them advantages of being on the other side of what you do, right? If I didn't understand the person sitting across the table from me, I couldn't do the job I do now because then it would just be about me where I've been on that other side of the table and I understand where you're coming from when you're sitting as a client and not just as an attorney. Right, and so when I was, uh, I'm a huge nerd, much like you, Colden, whether you want to admit it or not. Right, um, 
when I was like 15, 16, 17, I was in RTC along with soccer and all this stuff. I would go to leadership camps. People are going and having fun during summer. I'm going to leadership camps, business camps, all these kind of different kind of legal camps. And there was an international law uh, professional that came and spoke at one of the camps. And that's the one thing I love. I, I love travel. I love the international concept. I majored in international studies. And so I decided that's what I want to do. I want to do international law. And so that was kind of the foray into the law was just working for free and working at a, as a janitor in my middle school as my first job and working ever since I was 14 years old. Wow. So that was, that was kind of your, your adolescence and experiences during that period. I know I have my fair share of yep. stupid decisions. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know if I call them stupid. They were, they were profitable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some, some more than others. Um, okay. So, so going ahead and then you ended up going to law. Did you go straight to law school? Went to law school. So I went through my uh, college years, uh, majored in international studies, minored in English, uh, full intention of going to law school. Uh, Loyola Law School had a, one of the best international law programs. So went to Loyola Law School. It was great. It was actually the in a Loyola that's down in New Orleans. Okay. So uh, didn't mind the law school years. Uh, we started off with like 400 in our class. I think we ended with like 114 or something <laughs> like that. Uh, had some classmates who would literally go to the casino all night and uh, gamble and then go to class, or they would uh, literally take night classes so that way they could sleep in during the day after <laughs> drinking all night. Uh, some made it, some didn't make it. Yep. <laughs> but I realized when I got down there that international law was not what I wanted because a lot of what international law has to do with is contract negotiation and paperwork, you know, kind of what we call in the law transactional work, where you're dealing more like this at a table than you are in a courtroom and litigating. And so I went ahead in two years, law school's three years, I went in two years and got my international law certificate, which kind of gave me advanced knowledge within international law. But it, it developed within me a passion for the law as a whole. And so my third year of law school, I actually came back to South Carolina the University of South Carolina, did my third year of law school there to focus on litigation. And I went back to working for that same law firm where I had been a janitor and had gone and interned at night you know, on weekends and gone over there and I interned with them as what we call a law clerk uh, during that third year and, and really enjoyed that. Uh, worked also with what we call the National Advocacy Center, which is the massive building right on the Carolina campus, South Carolina campus, where they train all the federal prosecutors. And I did that while I was in college and did that a little bit while I was in law school as well. So it kind of gave me an insight as to being a prosecutor, gave me an insight on the defense side, because that's what that firm was, was a big defense law firm, uh, which, again, I love the word perspective, because without that perspective, you can't understand the other side. And so I've had that ability to be on the other side of the table, to literally be a potential client, to be a prosecutor, to be a defense attorney, because now I'm more on the defense side where I – I'm on the plaintiff side. I'm on the defense of a criminal or some of that nature. So I've seen both sides and how that works. So I can try to understand how that works and not just be one-sided on an argument and an understanding. That makes perfect sense to me. And um, so whereabouts did you end up joining the South Carolina, is it the, it's not National Guard here. Yeah, State, State Guard. Guard. Yeah, State Guard. yeah, yeah. So um, the State Guard is fun. So like I said, I was in the ROTC. I did a lot of that stuff. And the State Guard is a group of professionals that basically volunteers their time to the state of South Carolina uh, in a military forum. And so it, it was started by Francis Marion, you know, the Patriot. It was started by him all the way back to the Revolution War. It's one of the longest uh, state guards in the entire country where you are actually literally just donating your time, and you do get some benefits for it. And, and so I joined the JAG Corps. And so Judge Advocate General, and that's the legal side of it, there's a medical side, a, a JAG Corps legal side, an engineering side, uh, minister ministry side. I'm sure there's others. <laughs> a police, there's a police side of it, where if a, a natural disaster or something happens in South Carolina, we get consulted and we go in and we can volunteer uh, and serve those areas during that time period. And so I do that for the coast of South Carolina. And this is my territory up here in the Myrtle Beach, Ori, Georgetown area, where we serve uh, and, and assist in terms of any kind of issue that develops in South Carolina where we can help out as a professional in those fields. Out of curiosity, was your first time jumping out of a plane with the State Guard? No. It wasn't? No. I, so I, that's me. I love 
um, working hard and playing hard. Let's lean into that. Right? And so um, the first time I jumped out of a plane was when I was 18 years old, and I took my mom for Mother's Day. And so in high school, um, so in high school, I got my scuba diving license uh, with my family, you know, back when I was like 16 years old. At 18, I uh, took my mom for skydiving the whole way down. She's, like, covering her eyes. She's <laughs> where she lost her glasses, but, you know, whatever. But, you know, that was the first time I was just, like, let's go do this. And then, you know, that thrill, that passion, you know, and it's not the – if you've ever been skydiving, there's two major parts. I guess there's maybe three major parts. It's the prep up. you got to get past that just stepping out of the plane, right? Because when you step out of the plane, it's over. There's nothing you can do. I mean, whether the chute pops or not, your job's done. <laughs> Okay, and so you got to just get you got to gear yourself up to step out of the plane, and once you do that, that's step one, and then you the free fall, right? Just the pure exhilaration of falling, and feeling that rush coming at you, and then you pull the chute, and it's the gliding. And so I, I compare it to being at the beach, right? So first you just got to get to the beach, right? You got to deal with the traffic, got to deal with the mess, and once you decide you want to do that, you're good, right? That's like stepping out of the plane. You get to the beach. Some people just want to lay on the beach. They don't want to do anything. They just want to relax. Enjoy the sun. That's like pulling the chute and, and just kind of just gliding in the air. Me, I'm the guy that wants to get into the water and swim with the sharks, right? I'm like, let's go in the water. Let's go see what's down there. Let, oh, there's a great white out there. Let's go grab on. Let's take a ride. Let's go. <laughs> That's like falling. That's the free fall. Where you're like, let's just feel this, right, the, the rush and the thrill. Um, and, and it's such an exhilarating experience that you can't think of anything else, right? You're just enjoying the moment. And that's kind of like life, right? Sometimes you just got to take the plunge. And you just got to take that risk. It's like starting a business. It's like getting married. It's like having kids. There's never the right time to jump out of a plane. You just got to decide you want to do it. That's just the way it is. Never the right time to get married. Never the right time to have a kid. Never the right time to, to, to have a, you know, start a business because there's always something that can stop you. You just got to do it. And it's like making decisions as a leader. You just got to make a decision. Just decide you want it. You're absolutely right. Just go. What if, if you had to... Name a top three, a top three list for, because I know you, you yeah. seek these ventures out. Love them. Um, if you had to compile a, a top three, what would they be? So a top three thrill list? So yeah. I'll tell you my perfect weekend. Okay. It's three. <laughs> my perfect weekend would be this. So, and it's right here. So up in Greenville, um, you, can, you can go skydiving. So uh, I've skydived up there. You can go race car driving and you can go whitewater rafting. So I would go up there on a, on a Friday and I would, I would go up to the racetrack at BMW, which I've done, which is awesome. <laughs> and you race the cars around the racetrack, figure eights and loops and wet courses and obstacle courses and all kinds of fun stuff. Like road course, just fun. You know, the first time I went up there and did it, uh, I'm a port ambassador for the state of South Carolina. And so they took all the port ambassadors up there to have an LL and maritime law. Yep. Right. And so I went up there and, and I was paired up with Buddy Pugh. Buddy Pugh is the head football coach for South Carolina State. And so... He and I got into a car, and, you know, we were just chatting. He and I got into a car. And I'm like, all right, let's go, buddy. I'm thinking, you know, football player, head football coach. Like, let's do this. But he's going, like, <laughs> 60 miles per hour. I'm like, buddy, come on, man. He, like, gets up, like, 80, 90 miles per hour on this track. I'm like, all right, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> and, we get there, and the cars go up to 160. I think I probably hit 154. I don't think I got to 160. I was like, 154. And he's just like, what the? <laughs> like, let's go. There's no governors on it. Like, you're just racing, man. It was awesome. You're sliding. You're doing your thing. And it's just fun, right? And they give you the cars to use. If you want to worry it's not your car. You, know, you can do what you want to do with it, right? You don't have to replace the tires on it, right? And so you're just rolling. So I would do that on Friday. Just go and have fun, right? And I, I want to take my kids there for that's where I want them to learn how to drive. <laughs> they can learn how to drive 160 miles per hour. They can handle 60. That's right. Right. So they went there for that. And now, and then on Friday, I would go over, and I would go whitewater rafting or something. You know, go whitewater rafting. Go hit up, you know, Asheville in that area. You know, you know, I love the mountains. You know, Asheville is one of my favorite places. Go whitewater rafting all around that area, and do it up. You know, and just spend the day doing that. And then on that next day, on that Sunday, let's go skydiving. Right. Go over to Anderson. <laughs> Uh, that's the first time I ever did a static line. You know, that's where you just jump by yourself, right? And go do over to Anderson and just go skydiving, right? So just hit it up. You know, go race car driving, whitewater rafting. Let's go skydiving. Let's just do it all in one weekend, right? And you come back to work on Monday and you're like, this stinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's make some money and go do it again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Wow. Well, uh, that sounds like something you ought to put in the books. Then. I know, right? Well, you should go. I'm up for it. All right, let's do it. That's I'm what I'm saying, it. right? Let's all go right. jump, man. I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? You know, we all die one day. We just all do. I mean, 
Benjamin Franklin said, you know, two things you can't avoid are taxes and death. Nowadays, people avoid taxes all the time. <laughs> That's what any lawyers, right? Call us, right? But, but you can't avoid death. So why be afraid of it? Why fear the one thing you can't control, right? Why, why run in fear in, in, instead of enjoying what you do have, right? So many people want to face, and you see it all the time, they want to face, hey, how do I stay young? You don't. Every day you get older. Stop trying to stay young. Enjoy the age you have. Some people don't live, right? You're, you woke up that morning, right? Because you woke up that morning, you are blessed. So instead of being upset that you're older when you woke up, be blessed that you actually woke up, right? In my job, so many people don't wake up, right? So instead of reflecting on what you don't have, reflect on what you do have, right? Instead of reflecting on what I can have, reflect on how blessed you are to have anything at all, right? Simply by being who we are, Right, look, I mean, look at us. Right, I have clothes on. Some people can't afford the clothes we have. I'm here. Some people can't speak, speak any language, can't speak English. They can't read. They can't write. They live on a dollar a day. And I'm being PO'd because I can't get a job, but yet I'm getting government benefits valued at $30,000 a year, where some people work their butts off in other countries and don't make $10,000 in a year. No, you're blessed. So enjoy the blessings that we have. You know, quit looking at your neighbor and saying, I wish I could have that, instead of look at yourself and say, I'm blessed just simply to have what I have. And so that's what we try to do. Every day I wake up, I'm just blessed, and so I'm going to live my life to the fullest. 100% live my life to the fullest, right? And, and, and I walk the line sometimes, <laughs> right? And everyone will tell you I walk the line sometimes. And, and, but uh, if I die walking that line, then I'm going to die. And that was my day. I'm right there with you. Right. That's my day. That's what life insurance is for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gratitude. It's just being grateful for, for the things that you have rather than focusing on the things that you don't. That's right. And so many people live their entire lives in fear, and it's just such a sad thing. What causes stress is trying to control what you can't control. If you can't control it, stop trying to control it. Stop worrying about it. Just, just go. Just go and give it to God. Give it to the person that can control it. I don't know how to do everything in life. The best thing you can possibly know is what you don't know. Because if you think you know everything and things don't go your way, you're going to beat yourself up because they didn't go the way you thought they, were, they should. But you didn't have the knowledge or experience to know how they should have gone in the first place. Right? That's one of the biggest things I had to learn as a professional when we started the firm was I can't do all my branding. I can't do all my finances. I can't do the stuff I don't know how to do. So I have to implement a team that knows how to do it. And if I try to do everything then I will fail at anything I do because I can't devote the time I need to to what I can do. Put the people in place that know what to do and allow them to do it and get out of their way, period. And that's been right from the start of the firm. Right from the start. Right. When we started the firm, there were two attorneys, one paralegal. When I, when I walked in that firm, so the firm started not because I wanted it to, because God wanted it to do. Golden, I had one law school accept me into law school. I, I was on a waiting list for everybody else, right? And I could have waited. I had one law school except me in law school, so I went there, right? And that was the one I wanted to go to because it's the international law program, right? But that's where I was supposed to go. And when I came out, I had one job offer come to me. When I had that job offer, I had a case against a firm, a law firm down in Georgetown, and they offered me a job because that law firm had given me that, that case, because I had taken that case to trial, that law firm in Georgetown thought I should come work with them. I came down there to Georgetown. I had, I had back surgery roughly five years, maybe you know, give or take five years after I started that firm, where they basically it felt like they pushed me out to a point. And I don't know if they were or not, but that's the way it felt coming off of back surgery like I had. And, and I had, took another job. That other job fired me two days before Christmas. Literally two days before Christmas. My wife at that time was four months pregnant with our first child. I had no idea it was coming. I was literally checking my phone for, to get directions to go to the firm Christmas party. And I had a voicemail. And I listened to the voicemail because that's what I do. You know, if, if you know me, I check my voicemails. I check my emails. I try to do it every day. I don't want anything to go below. Because to me, if I call my attorney, I want my attorney calling me back. If I email my attorney, I want my attorney emailing me back. So I want to do that for my client. Right? And so I check it, and it's my boss at that time saying, don't bother coming to the Christmas party, you know, December 22nd or December 23rd, whatever it is. 
So I'm already dressed up. I'm literally looking for directions. I'm already dressed up. I look at my wife and I say, well, how about you and I go to dinner? <laughs> and so that was December 23rd. I had run, it was, I think it was because I, I ran for a political office and he didn't agree with the party I ran with. And so he decided to let me go, which is fine because it allowed me to meet my former partner. And yeah, I got to know each other and we talked about opening up our own firm at one point. And so I called up my former partner who had won, I lost. I said, look, you're a winner. I'm a loser, but you need someone to run your office while you're not there. How about we start up a firm? Instead of wallowing in my pity on the 22nd or 23rd, I went ahead with him and opened up a firm seven days later, January 1st. We opened up a firm. He had, he had his practice. I went and joined that. And we started off with two attorneys, one paralegal, and 70 cases. And, and just, like I said, just last month, we had 300 cases come in last month alone. So 10 years later. We had more cases come in in one month than we had come in the entire year, our first year. But I could have sat back and said, what am I to do? I have a wife, a kid coming, no job, no savings. I have nothing. But instead of that, I open up a firm seven days later, and God has put us where we are now 10 years later. I have nothing to complain about. God's always put me where I need to be. And he knows what he's doing. And I just have to have trust in that because I don't have control in that. And if I try to take control... Then I put myself in places where I shouldn't be. Right? And so that's that's what that's what we do. We control what we can control, and we put trust where we can't control it. And it always works out. I think that's a story that, you know, a lot of people might find themselves in that situation. Not not too many off awful many do, but Everybody you know, does. there's Everybody a lot does. of people find themselves in something, some kind of bump in the road like that, you know, where it seems like the whole world is kind of just there to beat you down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's very inspiring, I think, in the way that you handled it, the way that you, you know, you didn't wait too awful long. What was the time period you said again? Seven days. Seven days. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, is, you know, in life, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be that catastrophic, right? Like, you know, my wife is pregnant. I don't have a job. <laughs> what am I going to do, right? Uh, you know, I'm mortgage, I pay everything. But, you know, sometimes it's the concept of my car broke down. Right, is I got a flat tire. Right, everybody's got something. I bump in the road. The question is, do you take a step forward? Do you get stagnant and stop? Do you take a step backwards? Right, for the firm, for our clients, for everything. As a leader, it's simple as move forward, move forward. Right, if if you you have to make a decision in life to be positive and always move forward. If you dwell on a problem, you will always see a problem. If you do it well on a solution, then you'll always see a solution. And if you drive towards a solution every day, just a little bit, you'll get there, right? If you stop because you can't make a decision, you're going nowhere. And if you focus on the problem, you're not solving anything. So always focus on a solution, right? That's why I tell the team, I don't expect perfection. Nobody's perfect. You know, you know, all we do, we all make mistakes. All I want you to do is just to make a decision and drive towards that decision. And if you fail, you fail. Some of the best people in life have failed. Thomas Edison failed, right? Abraham Lincoln failed. Everybody that's ever been successful has failed. That's because they kept driving towards the solution until they found the solution. Always drive towards the solution, period. Failure is just another opportunity to learn. Failure is just an opportunity. You know, you, you learn from your mistakes. Yeah, you just keep going. And, and all failure shows is that you're trying, right? I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Right, I'm, ask my wife, ask Coleman, <laughs> right? But I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to drive towards that decision. And, and I will fail, but I know I'm going to fail. But I, and I tell my wife this, I'm not perfect. I will never be perfect. But I will always drive towards perfection. Because I'll always try to be as best as I possibly can be, knowing that I'm going to fail, knowing that I won't succeed, but knowing that somewhere there will be a solution along the way that's good enough. I will get somewhere that's better than doing nothing. Other than you know, wallowing in my pity. Oh, this girl broke up with me. Oh, I lost my job. I lost my house. You can have another job. You can have another house. You can have another girl. Right? But you can never have another life. You have one life. Drive that life as hard as you can. That's why I don't sleep. Right? Why sleep? Well, I'm not going to waste my life watching TV and sleeping when I can use the limited time I have because that's the one thing I can't get back. Use the limited time I have to drive forward. Always drive forward. While we're talking about sleep, we might as well touch on 
the breakdown of your daily routine. All right. It's one of the more mad routines that I've heard to date. Um, it's definitely something that I think a lot of people would probably think you're insane. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's hear, let's maybe, hear the breakdown. Maybe it's because I don't sleep. I am insane. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, on a normal day and, and, and you know, most people know this, like I love my, the one reason I didn't like the whole international laws because it wasn't as much interaction with people as I wanted. Right. So most of the time I'll have a meeting in the morning, give or take seven, seven thirty. So I'll wake up six thirty seven every morning, get ready for the day. I love jumping in like a nice cold shower. Right. Just, I, I, I don't turn the water on, just stand in the shower and then turn the water on. Right. Cause you know, I mean, it sometimes takes 30 seconds. Sometimes it takes a minute or two. Oh, yeah. You get that cold water coming at you and then it gets warm and then you're, then you feel good. Right. So you wake up, get that cold shower going. I'll get to my first meeting again, seven, seven thirty in the morning. A lot of times it's a networking meeting, right? Create relationships, get to know people, meet people, be with people, right? Build that relationship that you have with people that's sustaining. That's not just a one-off, right? And when I used to go to conventions, I would go and I would try to talk to everybody. And I would leave with no connections instead of just picking one or two people that I could actually create a relationship with, right? Instead of talking to 300 people at a convention, talk to three and, and get to know who they are and get to know who their families are. And so I've tried to incorporate that into what I would call our branding, right? That's what we do. We build relationships. Like we're not going to be on a billboard and jumping over cars because that's to me not what an attorney should do. We should be a part of the community, right? We're committed counsel, right? Committed counsel to our clients and our community and our coworkers. You can't be committed if all you do is touch them you gotta embrace them you gotta hold them and let them know that you're there and and they know that you're always going to be there right so we do that every day so up at an atom 6 37 and then i start my meetings you know or court or whatever it is all day long um, usually i'll have 10 to 12 meetings a day or i'll have court or i have depositions that's the fun part like me and people actually getting in there doing it I got a beautiful wife, beautiful kids, six and nine year old, right? So I try to leave the office, give or take five, five thirty, and go eat dinner with the family, go hang out with the family for an hour or so. Uh, we don't have cable, we don't have TV, right? Because I want I want us to be together as a family. I go for a walk, whatever it is we might do, and then I'll we'll tuck the kids into bed eight nine o'clock at night. They're getting older, so that, this might change. But eight or nine o'clock at night, spend some time with Lauren, my wife, and then I'll go back to the office, give or take nine o'clock at night. Um, I love it. I tell my wife I have a mistress. Her name is Silence. <laughs> like, like you go to the office at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, no one's there. No one's calling. Emails don't come in. And that's when I check my emails, right? Because <laughs> you try checking your emails at 1 in the afternoon or 10 in the morning, you're going to get another email back, right? You always get an email back. Well, if you check them at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night, most of the time people aren't emailing you back, right? So you can actually get through your emails. You know? <laughs> that's just how it is. That's like doing phone calls. I don't return phone calls unless I'm like in the car because I can't do anything else in the car. So I might as well just return phone calls while I'm in the car. Yep. So I'll get on average somewhere around 12 to 14 voicemails a day. And so when I'm driving around, I'll return my voicemails because that's when the, I can't check emails. So I can't meet with people. Perfect time to return, right? So I'll get about, I don't know, about 12, 14 voicemails a day and about somewhere around 150 to 250 emails a day. So I'll spend my evening checking my emails and every, every day, just getting back to everybody. Um, even if it's just, I got your email, I don't know the answer, but I'll get back to you. Because again, as a, as a client, I would want that response. I just would want someone to say, I acknowledge you, right? Because if you don't get the response saying, hey, I got your email, you don't know if they got your email. And then you're left in a quandary of, should I send another email? Should I not? Why are they not responding to me? Do they not like me? What do I do? Just eliminate that as a professional and say, I got it. I'll get back to you. So I'll do that, you know. Or take nine, ten o'clock at night, and, and I'll do some work. Like last night, I drafted up a complaint. And that's how that's how you file a lawsuit. And so I left the office about twelve thirty. I'll leave about twelve to one, somewhere in that time frame, generally. And then I'll um, go to the gym. Uh, that's my silence time. That's again my time where I can just focus, and I don't have to wait for any machines at one a.m. Right, right. You just get, get in there. You do your thing. You get out. You know your your two hour gym session turns into a one hour gym session because no one's talking to you. <laughs> you can just work out. And uh, I told Colton this before, I'll put my old, old school earplugs in with a wire and everything like that so that people know I have this in. And I don't attach it to any music or anything. I just tuck the wire into my pants, right? Because that way it was like, oh, he's listening to music. I, I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, right? And then I'll go get my cold shower again at 1, 1 1.30, whatever time it is. Get home, give or take 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, go to bed. 
Uh, wife is asleep by then, but get to bed at 1.30, 2 o'clock and wake up again 6, 6.30 the next morning. Um, usually work four to five hours on weekends, you know, Saturday and Sunday also. Just crank it out. So you're like four or four and a half hours of sleep? Yeah, average between four to five hours of sleep a night. You know, How long have you been doing that? Uh, eight years. Ten years. Were you, were you always, did you always kind of feel a need to have less sleep or less of a need no. for sleep? Dude, I would sleep until 10 or 12 o'clock in the morning. Like, I... I am not a morning person. When I was in college, I could stay up. I mean, I would do shots of Everclear, <laughs> vodka. Like, I could, I could be up till 4 or 5 in the morning. If I could sleep till 8, I was good. But if I had my way, I'd sleep till 10 a.m., noon. Like, I mean, I am not a morning. I'm still not a morning person. But, right, you just got to do it, right? So it wasn't until I started the firm that I was up. Because that's, that's, if I don't do my meetings, it's like when people say, oh, work out first thing so nothing else can happen. I go to meetings and re- make relationships first thing. So nothing can get in the way of those networking meetings, right? Because as a business owner, to me, there's nothing more important than establishing relationships. And that's with coworkers, with clients, with your community. Let people know who you are because there's nothing more important, again, as, as I believe to a professional, as reputation. If you don't have a reputation, then no one cares about you. If you have a bad reputation, nobody wants you, and you have a good reputation, you don't even have to market you just don't because people will inherently come to you. It's not even a want. They will need to come to you. And, and as a firm, as Winslow Law, we want people to say, we need Tom. We need those guys to help us out, right? And, and people know, I, last night, I have a group of engineers that I work with. I was talking to them at 10 p.m. last night because they know that I'm there for them, right? If they need me, I'll call them back at 10 p.m. Right. I've had meetings at my office at 11.30 at night because they know that I'm available because that's where I am. They're like, can I come see you tonight? Sure, come on down. That's, a, do que- that's a question I've heard, too, from people, too, is they wonder, you know, what's, what's that phone number that you're always sharing? Like, a lot of people may, may or may not know. That's your personal cell number. Yeah, 843-655-7333, every business card. That's my personal cell phone number. Absolutely. I'm not there to serve myself. I'm there to serve you. Being a professional doesn't mean I, could t- I take care of myself. Being an attorney means I serve you. I've, I've given my life to the law, and, and I've given myself to you to serve you, right? The firm, every attorney, every law firm knows the law. What, what lawyer didn't go to law school, right? Hopefully none of them. Right? Hopefully none of them. Kim Kardashian, right? <laughs> right? Hopefully none of them, right? Right? But they, they all know the law. That's, you pass the bar. Everybody knows the law, but not every lawyer serves you. A lot of times nowadays, lawyers serve themselves. They're more worried about the file and the work they have to get done than the person behind the file that they're serving. They're worried about the money that that file can make versus the benefit it can give you, the client. The truth is, is not every lawsuit's worth it. Is it worth spending $25,000 on a lawsuit to make $10,000? I don't care if you can win or not. Is it worth doing that? No. Absolutely not. Right? So, so you need a lawyer who will counsel you through the law, not just advocate for you. Because advocation is litigation. And not everybody needs litigation. Some people need to actually know how to stay out of trouble. That's the counseling. Some people need to say, it's not worth my business spending three years in litigation to try to get $5,000. The time suck and the, well, you know, what I call the opportunity cost, right? The time I'm going to spend, you know, the week in trial, I could make $15,000. Why am I going to try to make five, right? And attorneys are so inherently focused purely on the law only looking at the law, that they forget about the person. And so, so to me, it's so important that my team, my staff, me, we look at the actual person and what that person needs. Not what I want, but what that client, that community, what that coworker needs is way more important than any money I could ever make. And that's that purpose for you. That's that North Star. That's that why, right? You know, and, and, we, and, and anyone in our world should know what their why is. Not we, The what is the law, right? Every single person, Colton has a what. What do you do, right? That's the, what do you do? What, what kind of, what's your profession? No, it doesn't matter. It's, it's why do you do it that defines whether or not you do the job that's right for your clients, right? What do you do? Every lawyer does a law. Why do you do it? Do you do it for the billboard? Do you do it for the yacht? Do you do it for the person across the table from you 
who just lost their child, or a person across the hill from you who just lost their wife or spouse. Why do you do it? And if you say, I do it for the money, then to me, you're not doing the law for the right reason. If you say, I'm doing it for the person across the table from me, to put them where they need to be, to benefit them the best I can, then the money will come and the profit will come and the growth will come because you will earn the trust and respect and the reputation that lawyers should have. Right? The problem we have is too many lawyers are butts of jokes because they forgot why they did what they do. Nobody laughs about Atticus Finch, right, to kill a mockingbird. We always hear that reference. Yep. No one laughs about that. That's still regarded as the, the creme de la creme of the community, right, the, the guy everybody wants to be because his why was to serve. And that's what Winslow Law is. I want our why to always be service. And if, if we get blessed by doing that service, then thank God. And if we can actually bless someone else, thank God. And if not, then I shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And that why is why you're able to get up with four and a half, five hours of sleep. It's oh. that, I'm sure for you, you know, it's harder to wake up at college when you got some class to go to that you really don't want to go to and you got to, or you got to study or you got to do something you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. But when you wake up, like for me, you know, when I started the business, you know, it's like all of a sudden I could get up and it was just, it was a piece of cake. Like I wanted to be up. That's right. I wanted to serve. Right. I mean, I get one hour a day. I have 24 hours, all that, I get one hour a day and that's my gym time. That's the only time I focus on myself, right? The first half of the day, I'm taking care of clients, I'm taking care of coworkers, I'm serving them. The, the next part of the day with my family, I'm serving my children and my wife. I'm doing the dishes, I'm cooking dinner, I'm tucking my kids into bed, I'm giving them the time that I think they need, right? That night, I'm going back to the office, again, strictly for my clients, right? To do my work for my clients, to do their complaints and do what needs to be done for them. And then I have my one hour, I have my... my, my a little bit of time at the very end of the day where I can just focus on me and sweat and just get out the stress or whatever it is I have built up that day, right? But the rest of the day is about everyone else. And honestly, I want to change it. In today's society, I always see shirts and people saying, I got to focus on myself. I got to take care of A, number one. I got to take care of I. I got to take care of me. And to me, that's the problem, Right? When all we ever do is focus on ourselves, we can only give ourselves 100%, right? There's not more than 100%. You can only give yourself 100%. But if I take care of everyone else around me 100%, if I give 100% to every single person, and they all give me 100% back, the amount of percentage back I get is untold. It's never ending. It's infinite, right? So if I give 100% to myself, I'll get 100%. But if I give 100% to everybody else, and they give me 100% back, then it's limitless. Period. So why not give 100% to everybody? Why not wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to give 100% to my wife, my kids, my coworkers, my team, the community, to the guy holding the door for me, to the person driving by, beside me. Why am I not going to give 100% to every single person? And imagine how life would be if all we ever did was give 100% to everybody else and stop thinking about ourselves. What if everybody did that? Be a beautiful thing. Right? It's never going to happen. That's why I have a job. No, it won't, yeah. That's why I have a job. But it doesn't stop me from doing it because guess what? I can only control me. So just because you decide you don't want to do that, because you decide you don't want to talk to me, just because you decide you don't want to be mad at me, because you decide you don't like me, doesn't mean I don't like you. Doesn't mean I don't want to talk to you. Doesn't mean I don't want to be your friend. Doesn't mean I don't want to be there for you. Just because you decide something, I can't control what you decide. I'm not going to stress out about it. But I can control who I am. And just because you decide something doesn't mean I have to decide the same thing. Was this an innate drive for you? I mean, just... For your life, or or was there a pivotal moment where you just remember flipping a switch and seeing the world differently? Just, you know, my favorite word, and and Colton, you know this, my favorite word is perspective, right? When all you ever do is view it from your own perspective, right? Whether you grew up with privilege or whether you grew up with non-privilege, whether you grew up white, black, male, female, everybody grew up. And, And everyone has the attitude that they control. And you simply control your own attitude. Right, and I, I have the ability to get mad. <laughs> I have the ability to get sad. Uh, I am, I used to not have any emotion. Like I was just drive. Let's just, this is business. There's no empathy until I started viewing things from someone else's perspective. It wasn't just about me anymore. As a matter of fact, it had nothing to do with me anymore. Right? I didn't have to be the best. Right in school, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to, I'm going to stomp you down. I'm going to take you out. This is my world. Right. Instead, I said, let me just view it from your perspective and how you feel. Right? Let, me see, let me see it from a different angle. 
right? And that's, the, to me, the importance, right? I've been on the other side of the table. I've been the defense. I've been the prosecutor. I've been all sides of it. And so when I view it from the other side of the angle, why are we always in competition with each other and wanting to be better than everybody else? Why are we not working together to make the world a better place? Right? The, the law, justice, the court, is not about my client. And it's not about your client. It's about doing what's right. It's about justice, right? It's about lady justice is blind. So you can't see your client or my client. She's balanced in the scales, right? So why aren't we working together to find the best resolution for everybody in any kind of business? You know, the best resolution for everybody doesn't have to be contrary to anybody. Let's find something that works. Let's try to work this thing out. And if we can't, then we'll go fight about it. But if we can, why are we fighting about it? Why do I fight with my spouse when we should be together working through a situation? Why am I fighting with my kids when it's my job to coach them? Is that what I want them to do with their children? Why should I do that? Why do I do that with my coworkers? I'm the boss, but why do I do that with my coworkers? They're my team. Do I want them hating me because I get to tell them what to do? All right? No, my job is to, to work with people through that situation. It was just the ability to say, you know what? It doesn't have to be my way. I can view it from your perspective. And it took me a long time to get there. But being responsible, you know, as an attorney where I am, right, I got 25 people I consider to be on my team, right? Not just people inside the office, but people I work with outside the office that lean on me, right, for some kind of pay, maybe not all their pay, but for some kind of pay, which means their families lean on them, which they lean on me, which my clients lean on me, which means their families lean on me. So, you know, I'm not saying that I have responsibility, but I've got thousands of people that count on me just to simply do my job. If I don't do my job, then they can't do their job or they don't get paid. And then they have issues because I just simply decided not to do my job. So what excuse do I have to impact thousands of people by simply not wanting to get out of bed that day? No, that, that, there's no excuse for that. That's kind of selfish. So I'm not going to do it. A lot of people fold under that pressure. But it's exciting. Yeah. Like, let's attack it. Like, like why? I mean, the only responsibility you are given are those responsibilities which you can handle? Because if you can't handle it, they'll be taken away from you. All Absolutely. Right? So attack every day. And one day, if it gets too much, then it's not my time to leave anyway. <laughs> right? I'll get some sleep finally. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, you know, so you were the founder of the Go-Givers group. Go-Givers. Go-Givers, very day. much. I mean, fundamentally, it's you taking this message that you're, that you're talking about, this way of living your life and giving 100% to other people and focusing on, on giving. Yeah. You know, that's fundamentally what that, that group is built upon. Now, I'm assuming you had this framework, this mindset, and this mentality beforehand, and then you came in contact with the Go-Givers, the this book series, the message, and said, wow, this, is, this really resonates with, with kind of my core drive. Is that what drove you to start? Yeah, it's the, kind of interesting. You know, so um, Go-Givers was started by like three or four of us, and Marty, you know, and yep. Annie, who you, you might not know. There's a couple other people that started it. You ever take, I don't know, four years ago, so maybe three years ago. Uh, we meet every Tuesday at 730. Um, but it was started simply as kind of a networking group. That's all it was. Actually, we had never read the book. And it started the group based on the book. I had never actually read the book. You know, other people read the book. I just wanted to be there to network. Right, that was me. <laughs> And then um, Annie stepped down, and a couple other people stepped down. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to make this about the book. We're calling ourselves Go-Givers. We're not going to be a BNI. We're not going to be a GBN. We're going to be Go-Givers. And so we turned the group into more of kind of what we call, you know, it's almost a support group. It really is. Right? It's a social, it's right. really a social group. Right. It's a, it's a mastermind support group where we focus on the book and also networking. It's kind of this combination of all these things that's, to me, makes it a little bit unique in the area. Um, and we focus on taking the book and deciphering it just chapter by chapter and learning the keys from it and hopefully cultivating that mind. And all I wanted to do is to change people's perspective, right? I want them to stop thinking because most people, when they do sales, they're trained in a boilerplate kind of format or they're focused on making a sale instead of making a relationship. And, and when you go through the process, like, you know, Joe with ADT, who's the leading salesman for ADT throughout the country, he never follows the boilerplate, and he gets yelled out about it. <laughs> Emily, who does a great job with insurance, always says, I don't follow what they tell me to do, but everybody knows Emily. Right? Michelle, who is 
off the cuff like I am. Don't follow those formats, but you know them through that relationship, right? People in this community know those people, right? But sometimes what's funny is you don't actually 100% know what they're selling, but you know them. And then you learn them, and then you learn what they're selling, and you're like, okay, that's who I want to go to. Not because of what they have, but because of who they are, right? And that's that relationship. I get people that call us at Wednesday Law not because of needing anything, just because they want to run a question by us. Because they trust us enough to say, can I just ask you a question, right? And, and that's the beauty of it. And I'm, I'm, I tell them yes. They got my cell phone, right? I tell them yes. I don't charge them any money for it. Right? I'm just there for them. I want to be a resource. And that's what being a part of the community is, is being that resource, right? And so that's where Go-Givers is. We just want to be a resource for professionals to learn how to conduct business. And why do you conduct business? Not just what are you doing, but why are you doing it? For me, the Go-Givers group was an entirely new experience. I've been in some networking groups. I've been, you know, a member of the chamber, joined the chamber as soon as I got down here. Um, I knew moving to a place where I knew no one was leaving my entire family, friends behind, that one, it was going to be a rebirth that I very much needed. And also, I, I did also understand, though, the full importance of going out and like meeting people and making relationships. Because I was in a unique position of, I didn't just need new business. I needed friends. Mm -hmm. I needed, you know, people that I could count on. I needed, you know, people I could go to for counsel on, on things. So I really approached every networking event with that. And it's just my personality regardless. Um, but the Go-Givers group, I remember when, when you invited me to the, to the first one as a contingency. Um, it was... It was just a, an entirely new experience to me. And, you know, everybody there is there to, we don't need to just, not everybody takes their turn standing up and doing their little pitch spiel or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, we talk about how people's days are going, yeah. uh, how it might relate to the book. Some people go on full tangents and yeah. don't talk about the book for months on end and it doesn't matter. Uh, everybody's kind of just there to have a conversation and, and get to know one another. It's, it's one of the only networking groups I know that if, you know, I can't always make it, but if I go a week or two without attendance, I show up and everybody's you know, like, hey, how you been? You know, looking to catch up. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a different breed of group. And I, I think it's a very cool thing. It's taught me a lot. I think, yeah. you know, for me, it's funny. Um, I think if I, if I do decide to stand up and speak there, my whole spiel, if there's one thing I could think to say to that group, it would be ironic because I would probably talk about power of not talking yep. and like what I've been able to draw from that group. I'm able to go there and I am by no small margin, probably the youngest person in that room. And I'm surrounded by people who have more life experience than me, more business experience than me. And, you know, like a lot of the folks in there are, are going through spans of their lives that are totally, you know, a few chapters down the road for me. And it's from their perspective. Mm -hmm. But I get to sit there, step in their shoes with them for a moment and kind of just learn from, from what they have to say. You know, a, a wise man once said, you know, you were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. That's right. um, I've always been a listener. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to listen. Um, but I, I really do enjoy that group. So no, That's what it's about. I mean, and you learn so much and, and you conjure up so much more from listening. And that's, that's the beauty of it, right? From one chapter, right? And most of the chapters, and especially the book we're reading now, are like three or four pages. Again, so many different perspectives on the same words, right? And that's the beauty of it. When you're willing to listen, the diversity in thought is amazing. And, and that's, that's the glory of having a good team. You know, you know, that's, you know, at the firm, the beauty is that we can run things by each other and everybody sees it different. It's just like a jury. I got 12 people on a jury for a reason because everybody on that jury here's the exact same facts and evidence, they all think something different. Right? How's that possible? Well, that's life. Welcome to the world. Welcome to America. Everybody, we're living in the same place, but we all view it differently. We all hear it differently. And that's, that's what this group is boiled down to. It's, it's the same words all heard and applied differently to everybody. And you don't learn that by talking the entire time. You learn that by listening to what everybody else has to say. Just like listening to a client. You're not going to help the client if you don't know what they need. You know, Shut up and right. listen. <laughs> it's not, that's not something that's commonly practiced. I know for me, I, there's one thing that I probably that bleeds into all facets of my life that I struggle with the most. It's sleep. I, um, 
struggle to fall asleep. Awful. Um, and it's just because the second I lay down, there's that moment of like limbo mm -hmm. where like I'm not doing anything actively and I'm just there with my thoughts. I'll tell you, if you have four hours of sleep, you'll fall asleep pretty quickly. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I'll, uh, I'll have to try that out. Uh, I, drink, I drink coffee at midnight and I work out at 1 a.m. and it doesn't bother me <laughs> Yeah, you're, you must be out like a light. I'm gone. My wife is like, oh, no, Tom's home. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing, though, because in those moments, it's, it's, I'm sitting there and a lot of times it's racking ideas about business and, and trying to make, you know, you're trying to make this, your brain is justifying in a way that you're going to make a breakthrough there mm -hmm. or, or something. Mm -hmm. And you're just sitting there with your own thoughts bouncing off your own the inside of your skull rattling around and I can take all those thoughts that'll keep me awake for three hours and either call my dad up on the phone or my brother and, and just, you know, talk to somebody that I know from a networking group, go give her some, just somebody. And I can bounce all of what's going on in my brain. Turns out 90% of it's irrelevant once I've bounced it off somebody. And the 10% that's still relevant is all of a sudden we can sit there and have a conversation about a solution. It's, um, which, you know, that's where listening comes in for me. I've, I've always felt that, you know, by being able to not just listen, like sometimes, you know, obviously you got to put your piece in, um, to contribute to a conversation, but you know, that conversation can lead to more solutions if you're doing it with someone than, than just on your own. Nothing more important than having a team. And again, you know, whether that be a spouse or a, literally a team at work or you know, a sports team, whatever, that's why you have them. Right when you're doing it by yourself, you see one perspective, right? You see one set of eyes versus a whole bunch. What I've always done in legal writing or creative writing or whatever it is, just write. Just those thoughts you have at night. You know, grab a pad and just write them out. Just write, write, write. And and, and don't worry about correcting your spelling and worry about your spacing. Just write it out. And then when you're done, even before I do it, so that's my first draft. Before I do, it, I give it to somebody else. I say, just look it over. You have to correct and just look it over see if it makes sense material-wise, right? That's that discussion you're having. Let's just go through it. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? And then once you narrow down the scope or you're completely off scope, then you start worrying about the details. Is your punctuation right? Is your grammar right? Start, you know, narrow it down and then, then worry about the details at that point. Because the very first part of writing, the very first part of thought is just being a visionary. Like you're envisioning where you want to go. You're envisioning your thoughts for your future. You're envisioning what you want to benefit yourself, right? And then you refine those thoughts and then you add the details to those thoughts. Too many people get bogged down in the details to begin with. You know, I want to be the president. Well, how am I going to do that? How, how am I going to get there? Well, who cares? Just have the thought to begin with. If you never believe in it and you never have the thought, then you're not driving towards that solution. You're not driving towards that goal of yours, right? You're focused on the problem. How am I going to get there? That's a problem. I want to get there. It's the solution. Focus on the solution and then worry about the problems, right? Figure out the details as you go. And then you all know something. You're not going to know all the details. Hire people that know the details, yep. right? And then, then drive. Just drive. Like we said, drive and fail every, every part of your life. What's the, I, I, I've always told people, I'd rather love and loss than never to love at all, right? It's the same. I'd, never, I'd rather start a business and fail than never start a business at all. I'd rather get married and get divorced and never get married at all. And rather have children than not have children and never have children at all, right? Apply it, whatever you want. All it's saying is do it. Just do it. There's no excuse, just do it. And if you fail, you fail. Everybody fails. Everybody. I mean, even Jesus Christ died on the cross, right? We, we, we all will fall, but we will never succeed if we don't try. You're absolutely right. I know, and... For the short while I've, I've gotten to know you, um, I definitely see you as a, as a visionary in the way that you think and the way that you do things, whether you think so I, or not. I have a crazy vision. Whether Golden. you think so or not. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I see a lot of the things, especially with, with kind of some of the thought processes and things that you do with the community. Um, you know, you are, you are not one to, you know, move lightly within the community. You, you know, you make some noise. Is that, a, um, is that a weight comment? <laughs> Definitely not. All right, now. 15 <laughs> years, you're going to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, but, you know, it's when it comes to being that kind of individual, you know, there's, I always, you're always bouncing ideas off everybody and, and kind of just, oh, what do you, we think about doing this or doing that? You know, I've heard a multitude of ideas just in the past couple months. 
and there's always new ones coming. Yeah. So for you, how do you, cause I, I know for myself as well, there's so many things and, and different businesses I could start or other facets of the same business model that I could kind of do. There's the podcast, there's doing this, there all these different things. At the end of the day, how do you go about, what is your thought process behind, okay, here's a list of all these ideas and things that I want to do that I know could positively affect the lives of other people. How do you prioritize certain ones that you, not, not necessarily that it's more important than the yeah. others, but yeah. that it should be executed now as opposed to later? So um, a couple different thoughts on that. That's interesting. Number one, never be limited by who you are or what you do. Right? I want our law firm to be the Chick-fil-A law firm. Chick Fil A is not a law firm, right? I want us to have service like the Ritz Carlton. We're not, we're not a hotel, right? But don't be limited by your industry or who you are or where you're from. You only be limited by God. When you limit yourself, you'll never get to where you need to be, right? So I want us to have the top service, not just the, the quality of product, right? But I want our service to exemplify what a law firm should be like. I want you to want to come to the law firm and want to be served. Like, I want you to walk in and be like, would you like some coffee? Can I get your water? Can I hold the door for you? Let's have a valley parking out front, right? Let's, let's, let's be, right, the risk card. Let's be the creme de la creme, right? How can, you know, chick like, thank you for helping me out. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to help you, right? You're not doing me a favor. There's 10,000 attorneys, right? Like, let me serve you. Like, no, thank you for allowing me to serve you, Right? Don't be limited by your own thoughts or by, you know, other social media people or by what other people do and how they do it, right? Do something different. Do it your own way. And again, you might fail, but do it your own way. So, you know, in my thoughts, I do with you, you know, I look at other industries, it doesn't have, not necessarily mine, and I try to incorporate into mine what they have that benefits them. Because if it benefits a corporation like, you know, Amazon, it benefits a corporation like Ritz Carlton or Chick Fil A. Then why wouldn't it benefit a law firm? Maybe we'd have a better reputation as lawyers if we actually looked at other law, at other industries out there, right? And, and then, and then I never force an issue, right? I'm not going to go and say I'm going to start up a restaurant because I want to start up a restaurant, right? Opportunities come, and you take advantage of opportunities. Now you don't sit back and say I'm going to wait for the helicopter to show up and you turn away the helicopter, <laughs> right? You know, the, the fire truck shows up, you turn away the fire truck. Like, you got to look for them, and you, you got to take advantage of them, but, but you, at the same time, don't force it to happen. If it's supposed to happen, it'll happen. Right? When you try to force a situation, like, again, you try to force a relationship, right? You try to force a job, right? Whatever it is you're trying to force to work, it's not going to work. It's just not meant to be. And just accept that. Just, you know, again, you control what you control. You can still be friends. You can still... Uh, like your boss, you can still whatever it is, right? But you can't force it to work, right? So find the opportunity that's right for you and then give 100% towards it, right? And when you have an idea, don't discard the idea. Some ideas are crazy. Run it by somebody and them because it might not be your area, right? You know, we've got ideas all the time and I run them by you or other people, right? Let, you know, run them by people. Get their, get their thought on it, right? Perspective on it. And they might be like, you know, I know exactly how to make that happen. And you had no idea, right? You had the idea, but they have the details. Well, great. Now you're a great team, right? Just always be open, be open-minded. People always say, Tommy, you need to say no. <laughs> well, I don't want to say no. I want to say yes. <laughs> if I say no, nothing ever happens. That's right. I always want to say yes. Nothing wrong with that. Right. And every, everyone goes, Tommy, you do too much. Say no. Say no. I don't want to say no. I want to say Yes. <laughs> As long as you're still getting up in the morning, right. you know, yeah, if I'm not then I guess morning, you're not doing too much. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> That's right. Right. So let's say yes. And let's keep going. Yeah. So I think that offers a, a perfect leeway into what's, what's the future for Winslow law. What's, what's next on, uh, on the vision board? You know, um, everyone always says to have a vision board, right? I don't have a vision board. I have a God board. Okay. The door is open for whatever God wants. Right. You know, I went, I had one law school I was accepted to. I had one job I was given. Uh, with my wife, I had dated a girl for four years. She broke up. I broke up with her because she cheated on me after I bought her an engagement ring. I went out to Europe, bought a ticket to go to Europe like 
two days before Christmas. And I told my parents on Christmas Day, I'm going to Europe. I got to get away. And I, I came, when I was in Europe, God said to talk to Lauren, my wife. She was my best friend in high school at 14 years old. I was now in my last year of law school at 25 years old. and talked to her for like six years. She said yes, right? Nothing I've ever done in life. I, I started the law firm because I got fired, right? And now I have my own law firm because my partner wanted to do something different. Nothing I've ever done in life has been because of a success. All my good stuff in life has happened because of a failure. Everything. All because of failures and how I responded to them. Like every one of those, like I said, I'm done. Instead, I responded and said, let's go. Right? Every single one of them. And so when I say, here's my vision board, that's what I want. I want this vision. When, if I had what I wanted, I'd be married to another girl who had cheated on me. If I had what I wanted, I'd be working for a boss who let me go. If I had what I wanted, I'd never have my own law firm. Right? It doesn't matter what I want. It matters what God wants. It matters what my clients want. Right? I'm there to serve them and do what's best for them. And so we have... You know, our office in Columbia, we're looking at actually opening up another office. We're actually looking at hiring more people because the number of cases coming in. We're looking at creating a retreat that we have established out in Orange County. We're looking at setting up some fun branding opportunities in Georgetown and maybe Orange County. Right? We've got all these things out there. And if they're supposed to happen, they'll happen. And if they're not supposed to happen, they won't. But I can keep pushing until I fail. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just push, push, push until I fail. And then, honestly, when I'm done with those, we'll find something else to push. <laughs> And if I fail, I fail. If I lose it all, it wasn't mine to begin with. I love it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> all right. So coming into kind of our, our final segment here, um, I'm going to throw some, some interesting questions your way. Okay. And, and see how you want to respond. The first question I have here for you is if you could spend a day with one individual, dead or alive, who would that individual be? My wife. There's no better person than to spend the day with the person that you've committed yourself to 100%. There, you know, I spend so much time serving the community and clients that the hardest part is to serve my children and my wife because I know they're always going to be there, and I have to always remember not to take them for granted, and I do it all the time. And there's, I love the love languages, and her love language is time. And so if I had one day where I had nothing scheduled for that day, I made the commitment once I got married to give that to her. And I would give her 100% of that day to give her the time that she needs. So that way she knows that she's loved and appreciated for all she does for me. I love that. The next question here is when your time comes, how do you want to be remembered? I don't want to be remembered. I want what I've done to serve everyone else to allow them to be remembered. I want to give everyone else the tools they need to get past the legal situation they might be in, to stay out of the legal situation they might have gotten into, to equip them with the tools to be successful in what they do, to allow my children to succeed where I couldn't succeed. Right? I view life like a ladder. Right? My grandfather started off on the bottom rung. Right? My father went up one more rung. I went up one more rung. My kids go up one more rung. And everyone that I touch around me goes up on that ladder. And if I can get everyone in my life to do that, then I've had a fantastic life. Simply because I've been able to serve those people. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's deep. <laughs> That's a big one. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read you a quote here. Okay. We'll pick her out. From the current book I'm reading. This is something I've been doing at the end of some of the podcast episodes. Or will be doing at the end. All right. All right. So this is Winning the Unforgiving Race to Greatness by Tim Grover. I don't know if you know who Tim Grover is. Um, so Michael Jordan's, Kobe Bryant, uh, Dwayne Wade, he was, he was their personal trainer. A lot of times at night I'll sit at the office and I'll put things on from YouTube, like you know, different people speaking, yep. and I'll listen to that as I do my work, right? And so I love listening and hearing what some of these people have to say. All right, go for it. Tim Grover, Gary Vee. Yep, a lot of them. exactly right. So this quote is, is in this book by Tim, but it's actually from Kobe Bryant. And it is, rest at the end, not in the middle. Which nice to me, you know, I was, I was looking to get your feedback on that, but you literally just Always pretty try. much. Never stop, right? 
you know, we are limited only by our own willingness to work. That's just how, you know, not everyone can be as smart as the person next to them. Not everyone can be as pretty as you, Colden. You know, <laughs> not everyone can have the same attributes, but we all have the ability to have the same attitude, right? You can decide to wake up and say, I'm going to do what I have to do today. No excuses. None. The team has two rules, right? If you say you're going to be there, be there. If you say you're going to do it, do it. I don't want to hear your excuse. I got a flat tire. Get a taxi. I couldn't wake up. Set my alarm clock. I can't get that work done. Work three more hours tonight. Don't make excuses for me. I'm not going to tell you how to do your work, but you got to get your work done. If you can't, then no one's going to trust you. And if you don't trust you, you don't have the reputation you need to have to be successful. Right? I don't want to hear it. Right? Everyone can have the same attitude. Just certain people decide other things are more important. It's more important to get some sleep. It's more important to go to the beach. It's more important to skip work today. It's more important not to serve someone, but to serve myself. Who are you giving your 100% to? You giving it to yourself or you giving it to someone else? That's simple. You get to decide that every day. Absolutely right. What would be a word of advice to young students, maybe in law school, pursuing, pursuing a career in law? What would be some words of advice that you would have for them? Um, what you will learn in law school is not what you will need in the law. Law school will teach you the law, but it will not teach you the person that you're using the law for. Nowhere in law school do they actually teach you how to handle your own clients. They only teach you what to do once you have a client. And what good is the law if you don't have any clients? Right? The most important thing about being an attorney is serving the person in front of you and not the, not the file that's on the table. Serve the person in front of you. Understand who they are. Show them empathy and take care of them. Benefit them before you benefit yourself. That goes directly back to your, your statement about, you know, it sounds to me like you're saying, you know, the school teaches that what factor. It does. Uh, it doesn't teach you the why. I mean, all, think about college. What classes do you ever take in customer service? What classes did you ever take in empathy and understanding the person beside you? What class did you ever take on the client and not the file, not the computer, not the whatever it is? Every profession, it's always about the what. It's never about the why. Why? Do you think that that could partially be because to find the why, you, you have to, it has to be through experience? Do you think the why can be taught, or do you think it's something that we, we garner through our experience? I think, I think the why comes from a personal position and experience, but I do think it needs to be emphasized at every opportunity. Because what happens is that people become immune to caring about the why when all they do is focus on the what. Because the focus is so much on how can it benefit me Right? Why do people go to law school? A lot of them go to law school they want to make money. I mean, just, why do you go to medical school? I want to be a doctor. Why do you want to be a doctor? Because I want to make money. Right? Why do you have a job? I want to make money. Instead of, why are you doing that? Because I want to serve. I mean, probably the only profession that says I want to serve is ministry. Right? I mean, they don't go to school. Maybe teachers. Right? That's service. You know, police, firefighters. Right? That's service. They're going there purely for the purest fact they want to serve. That's their why. But that's every profession. Just some professions get paid more for it. Right? I mean, why are you playing basketball in the NBA? Because I want to provide entertainment for the people at home. Not because I want to make a lot of money. <laughs> right? Why are you doing it? doesn't matter what profession you are. Ask yourself why you're doing it. And if, if your why doesn't match your what, then you're not doing what you should be doing. Whether you're making money or not. Right? That's why attorneys have a huge drug addiction rate or alcohol rate or suicide rate. Because they burn out. Because they're not doing their why. They're simply doing their what. And they're having to compensate in another fashion for it. Right? You'll see attorneys either burn out or they'll retire. They don't just, you know, they die out. They don't, they don't retire in the middle, right? They, they burn out young. They die out old. They don't retire at 50 and 60. Right? They, they just keep going because either they love it or they hate it. And if you hate it, you've got to compensate in some other fashion for it. Right? Find your why and you'll never burn out. Right? I'll, I'll work... 16, 18 hours a day. I still love it. And you want to know the truth is? If I work 16, 18 hours a day, I'm working 
two days for every one of yours. I'm working twice as much as you are. I'm going to get twice as far as you do. It's just pure, you know, that's just how it is. Right? It's physics. If I do twice as much, I'm going to get twice as much. Because that's my why. I love it. I'm not tired of it. I still want to do more. I'm like, let's go. I'm leaving here going to a meeting. I'm leaving there and going home. I'm leaving there and going back to the office. Why? Because I want to. Not because I need to. Not because I, because I want to. I want to serve. Let's go. All right. So I've got two more questions for you here. All right. uh, one of them is probably the more far-fetched and un- most unreasonable question we've dropped on the podcast so far. All right. I love this so, kind of stuff. Let's go. So uh, as you know, Elon Musk is uh, planning on making a little trip out to Mars, hopefully within his lifetime. Well, hopefully not when he's dead. It's not going to be a whole lot of fun if he's dead. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were given the opportunity mm-hmm. to go mm-hmm. and you could come back within a reasonable span of time, but it would just be simply to go on the journey and have that experience, would you do it? Oh, yes. <laughs> 100%. The only issue I would have would be my wife would probably yell at me about it. So I'd have to figure that out, but 100%. All right. Why would you not go? <laughs> I mean, you talk about an opportunity. Embrace, right. baby. Take it. Oh, I'm in if, if it goes down. I don't, even care if this, I don't even care if it comes back. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I, you get to a certain point. Like, I have responsibilities, right? I got to take care of my kids. I'll talk to my wife. But you know what? That's something. I don't need to come back. <laughs> I'm good. What is that? Matt Damon and Martian, whatever that movie was? <laughs> yeah. Just leave me there. Heck yeah. That's Let's fun. do this. I'd be like the next Han Solo, the Han Solo of Mars. Hey, what do you, I'm saying, what do you, <laughs> don't even bring me back. I'm good. Just drop me off. Okay. If I die, I die. Have you, so I, I know you've done your fair share of skydiving. Yeah. What's the total count as of right now? Roughly around 40 or so. Okay. Have you, have you gone out of a um, hot air balloon yet? No. I'm thinking so, you got to get that done. Oh, so um, I went up to D.C., uh, a month ago, something like that, and they had the, the Air and Space Museum has the furthest skydiving jump, which was out of a hot air balloon because it went up into yep. space. And I was like, okay, all right, next mission. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't even know where you would do that around here, but you know what? We'll figure it out. Like, I mean, I just, yes, I mean, why not? Like, it'd be on a whole nother level, I the think. The thing is this when you lose your fear of dying, the whole world becomes available. Right? So many people are afraid of, I don't want to leave early. You know, we had the whole COVID thing. Look, I'm not, I'm going to die. I accept that. I'm good with it. I can die driving down the road as easy as I can from skydiving. I can die from cancer and I got no control over it. Why am I worried about it? Why? I can't control it. I can't do anything other than worry about it. So, you know, if I die from jumping out of a hot air balloon, so be it. At least I was living life, right? If I, if I live in fear of dying, that I'll never live the life I have. I'd rather live the life I have. Let's go. So you're putting that one on the list then? Let's go. Hell, that hell sounds yeah. like that's been on the list, huh? Dude, I'll do whatever. I mean, throw it out there, man. Like, let's skydive into a pit of sharks, and let's go swimming to <laughs> shore, and we'll go whitewater rafting on our – whatever. Why not? <laughs> let's enjoy it, man. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to be stupid and be like, oh, you know, come over here and slip my throat, but let's have some fun. Let's go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, you've done some some cave diving or, yep. yeah? Went spelunking and cave diving and all that, yeah. Where, whereabouts and what, what was that experience so, like? So, so let's go with spelunking. You know, when I went out, so I went out and saw my wife. And I, she was my girlfriend, right? My girlfriend. I was just dating her at that time. Okay. I don't know if that's true in Colorado. <laughs> um, look, I came back from Europe and I called up Lauren and I said, look, girl, um, I'm going to come out and see you during spring break, right? This is right, the next semester. After the, the girl I was going to be engaged to, she and I broke up. When I saw her during spring break, I hadn't seen her in like six years. Went out there for the week. We went all over Colorado. She lived in Colorado. Went uh, spelunking, which is like going through caves and squeezing through. I'm not the smallest guy in the world. They like squeezing through these little caverns and stuff. Went, you know, went all these like, you know, mountain climbing, went skiing, went, you know, just kind of the stuff I would love to do, right? And she did it with me. I came back from Colorado and I called her up. I said, hey, I want to be with you. Just, I mean, I'd seen her for a week in six years. So I want to be with you. But I'm taking the bar in South Carolina. I'm going to be practicing in South Carolina. If you want to be with me, you can come back here. And so she came back here after the bar. 
right? And she's like, what the heck are you doing to me? I've been talking to you all this time, but I'm coming back. A year later, we got married. You know, we're having kids. Like, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful story. She loves me. I love her. It's great, right? Um, but she's my she's my balance, man. Like, you know, she like, she's, I'm the, I'm the jagged line behind her. And she's just like the steady stream. But every once in a while, I'll get her to do crazy stuff like spelunking and cave diving and whitewater rafting, skiing, kind of. I do the black. She'll do like blues and greens. But, you know, it's fun <laughs> stuff, right? But, you know, and so she'll do it with me. And so, you know, cave diving and, again, I mean, all this stuff. I can't get her to skydive yet, but I'm working on it. You're working on but it. That's ever gonna <laughs> Last time we went, like, she's on the ground, like, Taking the video. Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> seen the footage. Like, you know, look at me like, uh oh. <laughs> that ain't happening. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're thinking. Someone's got to take care of the kids. <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair like, point. like, you got an excuse for like 14 more years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so the, the, the cave dive, I mean, what, what even, how, how do you do Is it snorkeling or you got scuba, scuba tank and scuba everything? Scuba tank and everything. Yeah. So, you know, when I was like, when I was 14, my mom, I guess that's where I get a lot of it from, right? My mom wanted to go scuba diving. So the whole family got licensed for scuba diving, you know? So uh, we got licensed. I haven't been scuba diving in a long time. But, yeah, I've never been. But yeah, cave diving and uh, wreck diving and spear fishing, right? Just fun stuff like that. And then, you know. Then it kind of turned into, you know, I think I was when I was 14, then skydiving with my mom when I was 18. So, yeah, my mom's kind of crazy. That's where I get it from. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, my dad was in the military. He's kind of that straight line, disciplined one. My mom's the crazy one, the jagged line. That was the this exact same dynamic at my household. <laughs> my mom was always the one she, she wanted. I remember um, at one point in time, I must have been 12 at the time, I was – all into BMX, yeah. dirt bikes, uh, just being a daredevil, an yeah. idiot, more or less. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, she wanted to get us the dirt bikes and everything. And my dad, oh, he snipped that right at the butt. It was like, That's no. That's family is, too. <laughs> so now I'm the dad, and I get to say yes. Yep. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go. You know, it's like the property, the retreat we're trying to make to the firm and stuff. You know, shoot and range and ride the bikes, ride the ATVs, you know, go go hunt the snakes. You know. That's like Lauren's, last. Like, Lauren's like, I'll stay in the car. <laughs> <laughs> On snakes, do this. snakes yeah. part. That'd, that'd be the one thing that'd be the you're hardest you're for me. Hacking the trails and there'll be a snake just like up in front of you. Like, all right, well, let's watch it for a little while. If I can see them and, and all that, it, they don't bother me if I'm looking at them. It's just if I don't know where the hell they are, <laughs> then I'm then I'm bothered. Well, I promise they're out there somewhere. Yep. yep, that's like the ocean. There's sharks out there somewhere, buddy. That's right. Just, have, just embrace it, man. That's right. Um, so well, if you ever find yourself. For any business or personal reasons heading to upstate New York, you let me know. Oh, I'll fly up right and there? I'll fly up and meet you there. All right. And I got some cliff jumping spots. Let's do it. I yeah, think we should so do that. So I want to throw a squirrel suit on. You know, the one where you fly yep. it out. I haven't done that yet either. I want to do that too. I wonder what the minimum height is for that. Minimum. I wonder what the maximum height is for that. I wonder, I wonder what the maximum weight is for that. I'm wondering if you could do it off and into water though. Well, yeah, probably, I, I don't mean, see probably why probably a I mean, you got, you got to somehow get the squirrel suit off because you got to be able to swim and stuff. True, yeah. You know, oh, man. I, you know, I've seen the um the videos, right, where you skydive down to skiing kind of thing, right? I don't know. There's so many. I'll just do it all. And then I'll I'll be good to go. I got life insurance, so we're good. Yeah, you're getting too comfortable with the skydiving. Oh, what's what's next? <laughs> that was the issue. Because, like, last time I went skydiving, I didn't feel the thrill quite as much. That's a problem, Colton. You reset and you reset that floor. Yeah, I forgot the dopamine. Yeah. And Lauren was like, um, <laughs> you know, we'll figure this out. Yeah, she's worried about what's next. <laughs> I'm sure. She, oh, that's every day she wakes up and she goes, All right, Tom, what are we doing today? Yep. Like, I'm like, nothing. She's like, mm hmm I guess we had the dinner yesterday. Yep. She's like, What are we doing? I'm like, Oh, we had dinner tonight. What? <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know my calendar till the day before or the next day. I'm right there with you though. I lo I love life like that. It's just, you know, you're so much more present when you're kind of just rolling with, with the tide, you know? It's like, it's like, you know, speaking or doing whatever we have to do. I'd rather just roll. Let's just go with it. Like, you know, it, and when you try to pre-plan so much, so much, you just can't. It's not the same feeling, right? You, you don't have that same excitement. You don't have the same passion, that energy. Like, you've got to have passion for what you're doing. And if all you ever do is plan it out, you can't have passion for it. It's just a scripted life. Like, gotta have that thrill, man. Gotta enjoy it. Every day, just wake up and go at it. All right, so I've got a, 
a final question for you. This one's a very, very broad question that I like to all ask right. all my guests. And that is, so I know the other week you, you wrote a, an article about entrepreneurship, yeah. about young entrepreneurs. It's something I heavily resonate with and a lot of my audience falls within that I category. So. <laughs> um, if, if you had a piece of advice for young entrepreneurs, what would, what would that advice be? And, uh, you know, a lot of them are just like, I know for myself, you know, got pushed into the college cookie cutter mm -hmm. and got spit out the other end with not a clue as mm -hmm. to actual applicable experience or, or skill sets, mm -hmm. uh, was mostly self-taught. YouTube's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, for the individuals that kind of come out of that or they're, they're some of them at a young age, you know, for me, it was like, you know, lemonade stand, trading cards, stuff like that. Uh, what would you, what would you tell the younger entrepreneurs? You got, you got the traditional, you know, don't stop, right? You're going to fail. Just keep pushing. Just keep going. To me, just go, who cares? Like, do it do it his way. No, I'm going to do it my way. Who cares what everybody else says? The reason you're an entrepreneur is because you don't care, right? Typically, entrepreneurs are those people that are in school that don't fit a box. Like, oh, just go work for Joe. Go work for the government. Go do whatever. No, do it your way. That's what makes entrepreneurs successful, that you're not like anybody else. That's why nobody understands them. Like how many people actually understand Elon Musk? Nobody knows that guy. Who cares? Right? Who, if you were just like everybody else, then just go work for somebody else. Do your thing. As an attorney, everyone's like, oh, go watch this guy do this, or go do it like that guy, or oh, be like him. No, forget that. Go be you. Go do you. And you know, if you fail being you, then at least you were you. You were trying to be somebody else. And if you were successful, you were successful, not somebody else. Who cares? Do it. Push, drive, be you. Who cares what everybody else says? That's a very heavy message, too, in today's day and age. Get them. We've got social media at play and a generation that has grown up on it now. Yeah. And it's just, it's constant. You know, it can be such a, a phenomenal tool to share value and experiences. Mm -hmm. But it can also be a massive black hole, mm -hmm. you know, for entrepreneurs, anybody for that matter, you know, you're looking at other people's lives, you're looking at the highlight reel of other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just looking in envy. Yeah. Well, no one's no one's. Here's the deal. No one's got a highlight reel. Everyone's got a reel. Everybody in life has a positive and a negative in it. You can't show me one life where someone hasn't failed, right? All you're seeing is what they want you to see, Correct. right? You might be better than they are. You just don't know. You know, nowadays in society where everybody wants to keep with the, up with the Joneses and, oh, I'm so beautiful, whatnot, half that stuff is fake anyway. Take your fake boobs out and you'll be better off, right? Be real. Be you. Look, I, I'm in a profession as an attorney where literally my job is for 50% of people not to like me. Like, that's literally my job. <laughs> I'm supposed to piss 50% of people off. I don't care. If you don't like me, don't work with me. If I have 1% of people that want to work with me, I got way too much work. Right? I only need one person to love me. All the other women in the world can hate me. <laughs> right? I only need two kids to listen to me. All the other kids can forget about me. Right? Who cares? Not everybody has to like you. Not everybody has to agree with you. All you have to do is have enough to be satisfied for yourself. And that might be one person for you. It might be 10,000 people for you. Who cares? Be you. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. When you start worrying about what everyone else thinks, you're never yourself. You're acting for them. Absolutely. Be right. you. Serve the people you need to serve. Doesn't matter who that is. It's a very strong message. Mr. Winslow? You say so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Colton. I appreciate it, man. It has been nothing but a pleasure. My pleasure Always as is. well. And uh, I look forward to having you on on another episode in the future. Well, only if you'll take me. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what the audience thinks. <laughs> we'll see what the audience thinks. <laughs> Thank you, Colton. I appreciate it, man. Yes, sir. My pleasure.